our theme throughout this talk will be essentially en plein air painting, the practice of painting directly from nature out of doors. This revolution was a technological one. So people have been painting out of doors since the 18th century, but using watercolors. So the revolution was that with the invention of the collapsible metal tube in America in the 1840s, artists could now go out and paint directly using pre-mixed oils. And the impressionist way was to apply the paint directly to their palette, but then not to mix it. The paint would then be applied a la prima directly to the canvas. And of course, the idea in impressionism is to use a technique known as the tash, which means essentially not so much dots of colour, but uh, quickly applied uh, sort of slashes of colour. You can already see those um, in the foreground. And then the idea was that the eye does the mixing. So you mustn't stand too close to an impressionist painting. You've got to step back from it. And then the optical effect is that the eye will do the mixing. This is Claude Monet painting. Uh, directly from nature out of doors, you can see that they become much more ambitious in terms of the size of their canvas. So again, in the 18th century, you would take a pad of paper out to sketch on in watercolours. You wouldn't attempt to take a canvas of this dimension out into the wilds. You can imagine all the practical difficulties. Here it's not so bad, we're in quite a civilised situation um, in midsummer. but many uh, en plein air painters uh, had a challenge. Uh, so here, before we get really stuck in Simone, is just a lovely little selection of the difficulties of this new phenomena of taking your canvas outdoors and working in oils, sometimes on canvas, sometimes on a wooden board, but the main thing was as you can see here, you had to cart out quite a lot of paraphernalia, particularly an umbrella, because you need to have a clear light source. So you don't want direct sun um, on your canvas. So the top image is in Scotland and dates to the era of Turner, who did indeed sketch directly uh, from nature out of doors. And you can see here they've got a ghillie uh, trying to keep all of the midges away from them. Uh, down the bottom, we have a chap called Pedder Ployer. He's in Denmark, in Jutland. He's on the beach in bright sunlight, no umbrella as you can see, attempting to capture the glistening effect of sunlight on the water. Uh, Croyer is sometimes uh, compared uh, to Soroya in Valencia or to, to John Singer Sergeant again. Famous, both of them famous for painting quickly out of doors. And then you may not recognize Carl Larson in the top image, who's attempting to do this in the snow. I'm just reminding you that artists were no longer just weekend painters or summer painters. They were painting all year long, but they were painting out of doors. So if you look carefully, Larson's got straw protectors around his feet to try and keep his feet warm. But even more amusingly, I mean, he's got a load of people in the village uh, looking over his shoulder probably wondering what on earth he is doing. And then the master of en plein air painting down the bottom is Eugene Boudin. He seemed to be one of the fa founding fathers of the entire school. And the important thing is that this isn't just a French school, as you probably gathered from my examples here, Scotland, and then uh, Denmark, and then Sweden, that this is a phenomenon that you can track all the way across Europe. And then popping up in between, Women artists also can now be seen abroad. So this is by uh, Sir John Lavery. He's a Glasgow boy, uh, but he's painting here uh, a lady who is at work at Grace Chulois, which is an artist colony near Fontainebleau. So this is another phenomena of this new technology that artists need to go out into the countryside or into the city uh, to find suitable subjects and they will congregate particularly in the summer in certain locations forming what we refer to as artist colonies. Uh, Germany will actually become a colony in its own right that was because when Monet settled there 
it encouraged a lot of other artists to work nearby. Interestingly, in the case of Giverny, many of those artists were American. And in fact, uh, one of his stepchildren uh, will marry at one of the American artistic colony. So the whole practice of art changed with the arrival of oil paints in tubes. So now let's get down uh, to Monet. He has a long life, as you can see. I'm hoping that I'll make it to 1926, well, 2026, to celebrate 100 years uh, since his birth. At the top, there's a, a nice description of what he looked like. Uh, because I think if you met Monet, you wouldn't have thought of him as an artist. He wasn't a dandy. Uh, so many artists like James McNeil Wister of the 19th century um, put a lot of effort into their sartorial elegance. Monet did not, especially once he acquired Giovanni and he put all, puts all of his energy into gardening, as we'll see later. So he's of medium height, stout, he did love his food, by the way, and his wine, with a thick neck and standing squarely on his legs, his hair cut very close. He had a clear ringing voice. He was extremely simple and natural. His direct way of speaking inspired confidence. However, I have to say, reading about his family life, he was also a bit of a dictatorial father, a bit of an, you know, an autocrat in his own family. And that description was from Paul Hellieu, one of his uh, contemporaries, not a, an impressionist per se, best known Hellieu as a portrait painter, but it's an immediate description. So some uh, facts down the bottom. He was born on the 14th of November uh, in Paris. And Paris is always lurking in the background of this story, because although he may go out to paint in Normandy, um, the paintings obviously need a market, and that market is primarily in Paris. And then, because he has such an astute dealer, Durand Ruel, who you'll meet later, uh, Monet's principal market by the 1890s will be America. Around about a third of all the water lily paintings can be found in America, and there is a version of his famous water lilies that you'll find in MoMA. So his family moves to La Havre in 1845. You'll have a map in a minute. And uh, his father is uh, a haute bourgeois, as we like to refer to it, upper middle class, uh, a businessman uh, working as a, a sort of merchant chandler. So already involved with shipping. And he expects his son to follow into the business and is really much put out right from the very beginning uh, when Monet essentially puts his foot down and says, there's no way I want to be a, a chandler working, you know, shipping. Uh, his aunt is more sympathetic. She's important in our story. And she basically is an amateur artist in her own right. And she will be much more sympathetic. And this will enable the young Monet to go to the the Arv Secondary School of the Arts. And we know that in the early 1850s, he was already visiting uh, Paris, where he was sketching the old masters and feeling his way uh, through the art establishments of Paris, which was obviously, like London, quite complex. So here is a map showing you where all these places are. That's always useful, isn't it? So there is Paris. And remembering that until uh, the 1890s, Monet is very hard up. It's not until they crack that American market, you could actually say that Monet's financial situation is secure. So what you tend to find is that he moves to Argentoy, uh, Vethoy, and then Poissy, so down the river towards the channel. So there's Argentoy, um, a suburb of Paris. And he moves down, he moves down river towards the channel to find cheaper places to live. And certainly Posse was a very low point um, as far as Monet was concerned uh, in terms of his family life. So you can see where Jovenet, Jovenet is. Uh, there is Rouen, uh, obviously he painted his cathedral. Uh, Enfleur is the home of Boudin. Here is Trouville and Deauville is very nearby. Uh, that was the game for the Haute Bourgeois. It's a seaside resort. Etretat is where many of them painted. Uh, Monet in particular painted at Saint-André uh, because his aunt and his father summered there. 
and La Havre, where he basically spent his formative years. There's London, putting it all into perspective. And that's important, in fact, uh, because there is a, an, a, a, an interlude, as you know, in London, if you went to the recent exhibition on Durand Ruel. And uh, for our artists, the other really important technical innovation, trains. So we're here, seeing here the Normandy train uh, coming into the Gare Saint-Lazare. And it was uh, improved transport that allowed weekend painting. So you would be attending a atelier, a workshop in the city, but then at the weekends and over long periods in the summer, you would be out painting in your colony uh, with your brother artists. Um, in particular, as I said, uh, Grey Sulois is sort of round about there. It's near Fontainebleau to the sort of south uh, west of, um, oh, southeast of Paris. Uh, so our story starts uh, with Eugene Boudin, who was in many ways, I think you would describe as self-taught. Um, he sort of got into painting uh, through selling supplies to all the other artists coming to sketch and to paint on plein air. Um, in Normandy. And as many of the artists came, who came to buy supplies were very hard up, uh, Boudin would do a deal. You know, he would uh, supply paints and canvases in exchange for paintings. So it wasn't long before he was at an art gallery by default, actually selling works. And then gradually he makes this shift uh, from seller um, into artist. And Enfleur, I'm sure you've been there, um, is incredibly picturesque. We're looking here um, across the harbour towards that charming little church, which is now a maritime museum. And at the end there, the red awning, if my cursor is working all right, is a place where I have spent many a happy hour sipping my wine. I'm looking forward to getting back there. We think that Monet and Boudin meet, or probably by mistake, well not by mistake, but certainly in a very unstructured way. It wasn't a formal meeting is what I'm trying to say, uh, but that probably Bouda met Monet while sketching on one of the uh, beaches around En Fleur. Uh, because we know that Monet began to sketch caricatures of his friends when he was still at school in his mid-teens. And down the bottom, we've got the little fish shop at Enfleur of 1854. And you can see already you, you might be talking about an impressionist style. But this, of course, was just designed to be a sketch. These were an aid to Boudin's memory. And he would then work up the finished painting um, in his studio. So here is a finished painting, a uh, much higher finish. This is the jetty at Enfleur of 1854. And this is what people expected. The whole reaction to Impressionism was that people thought that it was fraudulent, in effect, that they were trying to sell their sketches as though they were finished works of art. And the thing about a high finish, which means not seeing any brushwork at all, was that people could use this as a measure of the amount of work that an artist had put into uh, creating um, his view. The other important thing about this is the subject, which is very down to earth. Uh, we're seeing here a harbour scene. It looks like there are lots of uh, fish sellers on the beach. And what you're going to find throughout the images here is that there's an interesting contrast between bourgeois life and working class life, but also again, the impact of technology on life. So you're seeing the romantic sailing ships going in and out of the harbour. But yes, you've guessed it. We've got a steam packet on the other side, belching out fumes into the blue sky. And this is going to be a very important theme in terms of this idea that the 19th century artist should engage in modern life. When Monet met uh, Boudin and was introduced to en plein air painting, this idea of going forth as a realist and really painting what was directly in front of you, either in the city or the countryside, Monet is said to have declared, as if a veil had been torn away. Now, I mentioned that the area was already growing as a tourist attraction, largely down to those railway interconnections. And it was Gustave Legray, a pioneer photographer, and we know how important photography is 
for the development of Impressionism. I mean, the very name Impression was to give an almost snapshot-like sensation of looking at something very quickly. In fact, the term Impressionist was obviously derogatory when it was first implied. It meant something slight, not sort of worthy of uh, serious thought. And in fact, the Impressionists themselves, like Monet in particular, used the word sensation, uh, which is quite different if you think of it, because it's more like a, a bodily response to what you're looking at. But Gustave Le Grey here um, is, is showing you the tourist industry was developing a desire for views of Normandy. The tourists wanted to take home representations of what they had seen. And also you can see that Gustave Le Grey was developing this idea of modernity. So the, sh the sailing ship and the tugboat, the old age and the new age. And these are all going to be interesting subjects, the old and the new, the, you know, the beautiful sailing boat, as opposed to the rather ugly, I think, tugboat. are all going to be things that the, that the Impressionists will engage with. There's a, a sociological element to Impressionist painting that you may not have realized. So emphasizing the top end of the market, the tourist, uh, this is a beach scene at Trouville by uh, Buda of 1863. It's oil on wood, as you can see. Now, if you've ever been lucky enough to visit the uh, art gallery in La Havre, you know that Boudin's entire studio is there, all his early work, his sketches, and uh, there's a whole wall of these boards uh, with his, his preparatory works, either for the sea, the seascapes, the beach scenes, and the landscapes around en fleur. This one's in the melon. I've tried wherever I can uh, to put where the painting is. So this is the melon collection. So there's nearly three quarters of a mile of sand at, at Trouville. It's often described as the jewel of the coastline. And along with uh, do uh, Deauville was where you would find an interesting mix of middle and upper middle class and even royalty on the beach. I love how overdressed you are on the beach, uh, looking out at what appears to be some sort of regatta. Uh, they were both of them, both uh, Boudin and uh, Monet, were influenced by Jonkin, who's actually Dutch in terms of his origin. And here in the 1860s, he's painting the jetty at Enfleur. If you read about Yonkin, you'll know that he had a very tough time. He didn't succeed financially with his new vision of uh, nature. And I think he, I'm afraid, rather took to the bottle. He was your classic uh, bohemian artist who didn't quite fit in. But the important thing was that for both Monet and uh, for uh, Buddha, he was at the forefront of this new art of en plein air painting. And again, you're looking here at the entrance to the harbour. So just to remind you, when I'm saying that the revolution taking place, the Yonkin is a good example, it's not surprising that he was finding it difficult to sell his works when this was what was expected of you. So we've now jumped to 1857. Uh, Monet's mother dies, and then this is when he goes to live with his aunt, Marie-Jean Le Cadre. You'll see it's spelt different ways. Sometimes the L-E and Le Cadre are all in one, but I've gone with the traditional spelling here. Uh, he's conscripted in 1861 and is actually given almost a death sentence of seven years in the army. It was at this point that his father should have brought him out. This was again the accepted way. But he, uh, Monet and his father had already fallen out and his father uh, basically gave him an ultimatum. Give up painting or I won't buy you out. And Monet says that he won't give up painting. So he went to Algiers. He was in Tangier for about a year. And um, he gets typhoid there and is sent, uh, basically is sent home to recuperate, at which point his aunt will actually rescue him and buy him out. However, it's important that one year in the bright light of North Africa, as he says much later, again sort of gives him a taste of what's to come in terms of his intense interest in light. Having bought him out, his aunt again makes a stipulation. Um, he must study in Paris and study properly. So by 1862, we find him 
uh, in effect, article to Charles Glare, who is your classic academic painter, as you can see. This is just to remind you of what they're all up against, because this is what the public demand. And uh, Glare's uh, title is just entitled Evening Song. And as you can see, it's sort of Greco-Roman in terms of its setting. However, Charles Glare had in his studio work, in his atelier, I should say, his workshop, he's teaching a lot of other would-be artists. This is where Monet meets Renoir, Basile and Sisley. I have a soft spot for Basile. Sadly, he died in the Franco-Prussian War. So uh, once he settles in Paris, uh, he's moving backwards and forwards to Normandy by train for extended periods, or as I said earlier, almost a weekend painter. It's always a, it always draws him back. And his first exhibited work, 1864-65, was when it was shown in the Salon, is here again, a lot of subjects. It's not what you're expecting yet, is it, of a Monet? It's quite dull and overcast and showing the working side. This is a working landscape uh, where they're obviously gathering, harvesting uh, some sort of um, fish, seaweed, probably seaweed, kelp. It was used in a lot of processes. But the important thing is it's not a tourist landscape. It's very much a working landscape. And images like this were very much inspired, not by Turner, who you're always told is the father of French Impressionism. It's much more likely that he'd been working, looking at works by John Constable. And Constable caused something of a sensation in Paris with his famous landscape, New, otherwise known as the Hayway, when it was shown there in 1824. And as the name implies, Landscape New, Constable had shown a very prosaic um, image, a mill, but also in bright sunlight. Uh, so we're now in the Norton Simon, a, a wonderful collection in Pasadena, 1865. Uh, he's up there, uh, probably staying with his aunt, uh, painting the Normandy coast. We're back to Enfleur, as you can see. And I've got a close up of this to show you what I mean about the application of the paint, because already here it's broken up into what is known as a tash little uh, ribbons in this instance of paint, but you can see each brush stroke quite clearly. That is the tash. And the idea is that you stand back, we'll do it again for you. When you stand back, the eye blends these for you. As he develops his technique, this uh, tash, this broken, stippled application of the paint, well, eventually, of course, it will become quantalism. But that's not until the 1880s. And the idea of uh, using this technique was to give that sense of immediacy. And Monet was always interested in lights on objects right from the outset. So here you're looking at the effect of the light on the water, with little dabs of white uh, picking up the, uh, you know, the foam, the foam here around the base of the ship. Again, this one's in the Norton Simon in America. But they are quite dull at this stage uh, because he's very much influenced by the Barbizon school uh, who were centered in and around Fontainebleau. And often when he's on a campaign painting, um, he will be working alongside other artists. So in 1865, for instance, we find Monet in Normandy painting alongside Gustave Orbe, who will be a witness at his wedding in 1870. And perhaps even more surprisingly, he'll be painting alongside James McNeil Whistler, uh, the famous American. Uh, we know that Corbe and Whistler were actually literally painting alongside each other and would bathe in the sea, um, physically uh, becoming French Impressionists. Um, I imagine a bit chilly um, in the channel. Uh, in 1865. So they're that close. They're joined at the hip. So these are examples, in fact, from this era of um, Monet's career. So all of the little sketches that you see here, and it's very much marine painting, as you can see. Uh, many of them relate to Saint-André, which is where his father and his aunt had their sort of summer residence. So fishing boats off the Normandy coast down the Boston here, again, is quite interesting because it's a pastel and it shows you him, him experimenting with different media. 
and that's this one here on the right hand side which is simply called seascape storm and again you've got this sort of like dutch element where you've got a very big sky and they often used to say that the sentiment was in the sky so he was clearly influenced by Corbet, who was by far and away the more senior and well-established artist and was not officially part of the Barbizon colony, um, but is often linked to it because of his interest in realism, i.e. painting modern subjects. And uh, these are very prolific campaigns that these artists, they produced a lot. So in the three month period in Trouville, uh, Corbet produced, as you can see, 38 canvases, 25 seascapes, the one that I'm showing you with this wonderful sky, very much like a Dutch painting, one third land, two thirds sky, wonderfully atmospheric sky, Black Rocks at Trouville. It's in the National Gallery of Washington. This is Whistler painting virtually the same scene, but how different it is. And this is one of his masterpieces from the, uh, this campaign of 1865. You can see that the figure was a, a later thought as it's sort of ghosting through. And uh, you can imagine how the young Monet would have been looking at two incredibly different artists creating their own vision from the nature around them. This is not precisely dated, which is in a way frustrating, sort of it, but it's in this late 1860s period. But we do know that Corbet discovers Etretat in 1869 and actually settled there and spent the entire summer painting. And we'll come back uh, to Etretat later, as it's such an important uh, landscape for my Impressionist painters not just uh, Monet, though we're concentrating on him, but obviously Boudin also painted extensively at Etretat. Uh, so uh, Gustave Legray's photographs, I think sometimes prompted Monet in terms of what he chose to paint. They're all much earlier, as you can see. Uh, this is Gustave Legray's view of the beach at Saint André, uh, looking up from the cliff top, 1856. This is the sort of thing that tourists wanted to take home with them. And his uh, father and his aunt, Le Cadre, sorry, a double C by mistake, uh, they were ensconced in Saint Andre uh, during the summer months. And during 1867, we know that Monet basically spent the entire summer with them. Uh, he was beholden to both. Uh, he was on an allowance. He had to toe the line. Otherwise, they were constantly uh, threatening to cut him off. So it was a particularly difficult period for him as he was already involved with the love of his life, who you'll meet in a minute, uh, Camille. And uh, poor Camille was living destitute in Paris uh, while Monet was living in considerable comfort uh, by the seaside in Normandy. So this is just again to emphasize the sociological side of French Impressionism that may not have been apparent to you. So this is Monet's The Beach at Saint André, 1867, a working scene, fishermen, uh, they may be perhaps a tourist, but not many. I was thinking here of the figure on the beach, could easily be the wife of one of the fishermen, however, as opposed to this, which is exactly the same view as you can see, that uh, building you can see in both. But now we've moved to a bourgeois topic, uh, we're looking at a regatta and you can see already how he is thinking about series again i think gustav le gray would have probably given him this idea of actually choosing a spot and painting it at different times of the day and in different weather conditions 1867 produces his first masterpiece the famous terrace at saint andre um, which again is sort of this idea of modernity but you can see here along the horizon all of the ships some of them are sailing ships others are steamships and it it's a very strangely composed painting because as you can see on this side here there's a fence that goes through but that's actually supposed to be at a right angle because the flower bed um, is coming towards you You've also got these very dramatic shadows, which are now colored. We know that this painting, famous for its flags, um, is, is composed on the basis of a Japanese print. You can literally cut it into horizontal lines. 
the line of the fence that goes the whole way through and doesn't turn right angle as it should along the side of the flower bed optically it appears to carry on and then the line of the horizons you've got these very uh, delineated horizontal lines and we know that Monet was fascinated by the Japanese prints if you've ever been to Giverny you'll know that he had over 200 and I've drawn the lines in here one of them clips the top of Mount Fuji uh, the darker band at the top to give you some sense of depth uh, the balcony element, which was borrowed by many French Impressionists, again, is the clear horizontal running all the way through. And it was this type of Japanese visual perspective, as opposed to mathematical, that very much appealed to Monet and the other Impressionists. Now, I mentioned Camille. She was, um, she was not a working girl. Uh, she was essentially a professional model. And she took this work up because her family were hard up not destitute but certainly hard up and she's she actually models at the beginning of her career for quite a few different artists before she gets embroiled uh, with Monet that he is seven years her senior and at this stage not really in any position uh, to take on a wife or a family and she's the model for several of these 1860s paintings but the famous one is Camille or the woman in a green dress of 18. 66. In the year, in that summer when, you know, uh, Monet is on the Normandy coast, um, you know, painting Saint Andres uh, and enjoying himself, poor Camille is destitute in Paris and giving birth to their first son, uh, Jean. Inevitably, because of the very tough conditions that Camille lived in, she will develop tuberculosis. But it isn't that, sadly, that will, uh, you know, lead to her premature death. Uh, she'll actually die tragically young of ovarian cancer. So what he's doing at the moment, Monet, is playing cat and mouse, because just like uh, their aversion to him being an artist, they have a huge aversion to Camille. And when they marry in June 1870, Corbet was a witness. Camille's parents were there, um, but his uh, aunt and father were noticeable by their uh, absence. And to show you that they thought that Monet was a ne'er-do-well, Camille's dowry was tied up in a trust so that Monet's creditors couldn't get their hands on it. So they really are living hand to mouth. So it's quite amusing to see them here on the beach at Trouville, uh, it's posing as, as wealthy bourgeois uh, tourists. I say posing because they really can't afford this lifestyle at all. But it may be that again uh, Monet painted these in the hope that they would appeal uh, to the tourist trade. They were staying in the Hotel Tivoli, uh, which was more like a bed and breakfast place, so um, not upmarket at all compared to what the big hotels that you could find along the front. So all of these from 1870, and the one at the top here with the two figures, including uh, Madame Boudin in black, that's the one in the National Gallery. But you can see that Camille is, is portrayed very much as a, an upper middle class uh, genteel young lady. The other famous work from this honeymoon in uh, Trouville is the two young girls here in their wonderful uh, striped dresses. And then the images of the really posh hotels along the front. Uh, this is the Roche Noir. And already you can see he's exploiting this idea of painting the same motif but different times of the day and in different conditions. So this is the boardwalk on the beach at Trouville, again from the honeymoon. The thing to remember is that there are many Monets. They're not always easy to identify um, because he is painting the same motif over and over again. You've got to look for the slight differences in the details. I love all these flags, very important. It's quite windy if you've ever been there. And here we are, we are again in front of all the really posh hotels on the boardwalk. The flip side is the port at Trouville, the fishermen, the working class side. So all the way through here, you're going to get this initially in the 1960s in so 1860s in particular, you're going to get this contrast between bourgeois life and working class life. Then a calamity happens in France. It's called the Franco-Prussian War. And having served his one year in Algiers, I don't think Monet wanted to go to the front. 
And so he basically flees with Camille and his son Jean uh, to London. October 1870 is when they make the crossing. And this in a, a, a really weird way was pivotal in his entire career because it was in London that they actually met Durand Ruel, who was going to be the dealer who would turn around the fortunes of the French Impressionists. It takes a while, uh, Durand Ruel doesn't establish a market for them until the late 1880s and the heyday is the 1890s. Anyway, here is a rather nice, charming view courtesy of Monet of Green Park. And my portrait of Durand Ruel um, is by Renoir. He decides to come back to France after the Franco-Prussian War. Some linger, Sisley is still in London in 1873. Uh, but Monet decides to return to a war-torn war France. Not perhaps the best time to launch a radical art movement. He and the family relocate to Argentoy, where they live between 1871 and 78. And already you can see from the number of times that he paints the bridge at Argentoy, seven, and the railway bridge, which spans the Seine slightly upstream four times, that he's already thinking in terms of series. The broken brushwork, the tash, can be seen particularly effectively here in the flickering water where he's trying to know, literally get where the light um, is bouncing off the surface. More of that later. So these are all prequels, as you see. He's painting at Rouen in 1872. Uh, the Seine is bound to be an attractive subject. And then Sunrise Marine at the bottom, you guessed it, 1873 is going to end in this. Uh, Impression Sunrise, 1874, which he actually sold from the first Impressionist exhibition, which was held in the phot Photographic Gallery of Nadar, um, and he got a mere 800 francs for it. Honestly, there is, there's only 20, I think it's like 20 francs to the pound um, at this period. So that gives you some idea that he literally got about 10 pounds or less for it. So it's struggling. Uh, this was the first of a, a series of Impressionist exhibitions. They're not held every year. And the last one is uh, 1886. The term impression was used originally in a rather derogatory way, a, a personal impression rather than the objective expression of a subject must dominate. That was actually one of the more positive reviews of the uh, new French Impressionist vision of nature. And if you go to visit the dock at La Havre, they actually have pinpointed exactly the spot on the ground where Monet painted the hazy mist over the port at first light. Uh, we jump in time a little bit uh, to, because obviously much of uh, the 1870s uh, Monet is painting in and around Paris, Fontainebleau, so obviously my theme is here very much Normandy. So we jump to 1878. They're now at Vertoy because they can't afford to live at Argentoy anymore. Um, it's, come, it's become too expensive. And that's the reason why they're going to end up in 1881 in Poissy, which was a rental of a property uh, that Monet hated. Unfortunately, Camille uh, dies at Vertoy. That's, I'm afraid, Camille on her deathbed in 18. 79. But by that stage, um, the family of Monet's family, he's now got two children, uh, Michel and Jean, they are now living with Alice Hochaday, who is the wife of one of his most important patrons, Ernest Hochaday. But Hochaday went bankrupt and abandoned his family. And as much as anything out of necessity, the monet Hochaday family uh, join forces. This is because Alice can look after Monet's two young children, uh, Jean and Michel, and uh, she also needs support, and she is left with six children. Uh, so I'm showing you the sunflowers in the garden at Vertoy to show you that, right, again, as soon as you could get a garden, he began to develop one. And that at this stage in his life, uh, things aren't looking too good for Monet, and not only financially, but also in his personal life. 
but it also helps to explain why when they do move to Chavagny, that there's so much opposition as he does not marry Alice until Ernest Hoshaday, her husband, dies. So they live in sin in Chavagny, which does not please the, the locals. In 1882, this is before he's discovered uh, his uh, Normandy paradise, 1882, uh, the year before, he goes to Pourville and uh, we have a campaign of painting February uh, through to mid-April and then he'll go back in the summer. And these uh, two figures here on the edge are the Hoshaday children, the daughters of Ernst and Alice Hoshaday, uh, Martha and Blanche. Blanche is important, she's a painter in her own right. Uh, she will marry the eldest of the Monet children, uh, Jean, and she will look after our beloved Monet uh, when Alice dies. So she's a really important figure in the story. So we can whip through Pourville quite quickly, because what I want to show you is how he will again develop this idea of series. So here we are, this is on the coast. Uh, it's close to Dieppe, okay, in terms of the geography. And we're looking out here, again, very similar views. Uh, one is from 1882, and the edge of, in fact, they're both from 1882, but they're slightly different views, but not that different, are they, of the edge of the cliff at Pourville. And here is my map. So there is Pourville. This is Varangeville. You'll see it in a minute. And then this is Dieppe. And this is from the headland uh, on this side, looking back. Uh, towards Varangeville, an area of Normandy that I've come to know very well, because when you do a, a Normandy Monet tour, it's an, a part of the coastline that you drive. There are lots of views here of the cliffs at Fourville from different angles. Here we are down on the beach. 1882 now, you can see that his style um, has changed quite radically. Uh, the brush strokes have become longer and more fluid, and the application of the paint more textural. Look also at those coloured uh, shadows, picking up reflected light, a key ingredient of Impressionism. The customs house is painted many times over, again on the cliff looking out over the sea at Orville. Sometimes he bisects the landscape horizontally, as you can see here. Sometimes it's a dramatic foreshortening, where you're right on the edge of the cliff but appear to be on a stepladder uh, looking down. That's the impact of the Japanese print. This is the rising tide. Look at those little ships bobbing about in the background. Look at all the tashes, the application, quick application of the white paint of, of the waves. And here again, it's the same theme and a postcard showing you, we're not making this up, of what is referred to as the customs house at Pourville. I don't know if their intention was to stop pirates, or how they thought the customers was going to work. And in fact, by the time that Monet comes along, I think it's pretty much um, uh, on its way out in terms of its uh, practical function. But it clearly provided him with an interesting motif in his landscape. Again, like, it's very Japanese here. The, you know, there's no perspective between the land and the water. He also, well, it's about to travel to the Riviera. 1884, 1888, and then Venice not until 1908. So some people argue that the higher key of these paintings is due to his visit south. So I'm showing you uh, Brod Brodgera down the bottom, uh, and also you can see he's painted Normandy like it's Italy in terms of the stylized trees. Looking here at uh, Varangeville in grey weather across the valley of Bois de Moutier. This is the Moutier Valley. Some of you might know a little bit about uh, Bois de Moutier. It's a, a very famous arts and crafts house uh, by Lutchens, which becomes an artist colony uh, because its owner, Monsieur Mallet, invites all and sundry to spend summer at Bois de Moutier. Uh, so Monet would definitely have visited um, the, the famous house. This is the same motif as you can see. I'm just showing you how He's developing the series concept long before we get to the Haystacks, which is the first official series. And he clearly has a boat where he can go out and look back towards the cliffs at Varangeville with the wonderful little fisherman's church here up on the edge of the cliff. Very uh, precipitous um, you know, location on, 
on the opal. The, the various names for this part of France are the opal coast and the alabaster coast. And here he is closer to the cliff, almost as you can see, uh, right underneath it with the church sort of rather looming above it. You almost feel it's going to tip into the water because I know this area so well. I'm particularly fond of these images. And in Dieppe, it's the other way around. You're on the edge of the cliff. But again, if you're suffering from vertigo, this isn't good for you, is it? But I love the drop away, as you can see, um, into the shadow and all the tourists along the beach. It's whilst he's on these campaigns to uh, Porville, 1882, 1883, that he's looking out of the window of his train between Vernon and Gasny and sees the little hamlet of Jolene and decides to explore it. And he will initially rent a property there, which will now be developed, you know, it's now the fondation of uh, Germany, it shared actually sort of with the Musée Marmotin. And uh, the idea essentially was to, to find a, a location which would be a good base from, for which he could paint. It'll actually take him quite a long time to develop the garden. And the Jardin de la Artiste here at Germany actually dates to 1890. Uh, I'm showing you it here as it looks um, in late March, early April, uh, with the uh, blossom out and the tulips blooming. But the important thing is, even though he's got his garden and he's got a Giverny, which he doesn't own until the 1890s, he's only renting it, and it's, it's very much a, initially a, a farmhouse, the apple press, he still is going to campaign every summer. He'll visit uh, Normandy, he'll visit uh, Brittany, he'll go south, as we've already seen, to the Côte d'Azur, exploring different lights, different weather conditions, and different motifs. One that he was particularly attracted to was Etretat, this tiny uh, fishing village, again up on the Normandy coast. And the reason for this was it has very dramatic uh, cliffs. So this is the Port de Aval uh, in a stormy climate, as you can see, a stormy day. And this is uh, looking at the uh, Port de Aval uh, through another port where the uh, cliffs have been eroded. This is known as the Port de Almont. Right, so here it is. Here's a little map of Etretat actually explaining these important motifs. So it's a little fishing village at this stage. It hasn't been developed as a tourist attraction. This is the Manor Pool, uh, which is this thing here that looks like an elephant trunk. Uh, this is the Falaise de Amont. Uh, that's this little um, opening here that you can see in a large spit of cliff going out. And then this is the Falaise or the Cliffs de Aval, which is this bit here, which has a needle. Uh, which literally means needle, that stands out independently in the sea. Rather like the needles, if you've been to the Isle of Wight, or Old Harry, if you know about Swanage. Uh, so basically what you're going to see are lots of different views here. So we're looking here, we're looking towards this uh, motif, the Falaise de Almont, with the little gap, as you can see, uh, created this arch of, of cliff with all the fishing boats, because it was very much a fishing village. This one's from 1883. And uh, the motif looking the other way, the Port de Aval, was a challenge, because of course we've already established that Corbet spent the whole summer of 1869 at Etretat painting. I reckon on doing a big canvas on the cliff of Etretat, although it's terribly audacious of me to do that after Corbet, who did it so well, I'll try to do it differently. Those are not cottages, uh, those are literally thatched roofs put over the little boats to stop them filling up with water uh, during a great storm. So this is what the challenge was. Uh, this is one of Gustave Courbet's famous views of the Port de Aval of 1869. Yes, you're going to see immediately that it is painted in a much freer manner. And Monet paints it, you know, from different views. Uh, here he's quite high up and looking along the edge of the falaise, just means cliffs. This one's in Jerusalem, it's 1885. And this is just to remind you that it's a pretty, in fact, accurate depiction 
of what was directly in front of him. But now his interest is the different lights. So you'll see uh, the sun setting, the sun rising. Uh, this one's in North Carolina with the sun setting, as you can see. Or here it's actually set and you're just getting the golden glow um, in the background, little ships bobbing around. Look at all the little tashes um, in the foreground. And then here is the blazing sunset, uh, again, turning everything orange and purple. So long before the series, he's painting the same, the, technically the series are the poplars, the, hay, the haystacks, and Rouen Cathedral. Uh, but clearly he's, he's already exploiting this idea of the same motif at different times of the day and in different weather conditions. So this is looking down from the cliff. Uh, this is the boats going out in the morning to go fishing. So the light, as you can see, is uh, grey and rather murky. Uh, here it would appear to be in a blaze of a setting sun, at least I hope so, if I've got my geography right, because it's simply entitled Beach at Etretat. But again, you can see the boats are going out uh, rather than coming in. Uh, the uh, argile, the needle, was again another really important motif for Monet. So here's what it actually looks like. It literally is like a needle, as you can see. And he was fascinated by the sort of stormy waters around the base of these uh, chalk formations. And this is it from the other side. So you can see how he's just moving around the landscape. And of course, when you go to visit, you try to recreate photographically are all these different views, those little boats again bobbing around um, in the background. And looking down now, you see, so he's now moved up. And undoubtedly, this sort of looking down on the object uh, was the influence of the Japanese print. So this is the manor port, which literally looks like an elephant's trunk going into the water. You can see again that this uh, 1885 version in Philadelphia is a very accurate depiction of what was before um, Monet. It looks like a misty morning to me, uh, dawn rather than later in the day. But I think the interest in the Manipur was also because it linked to one of his own Japanese prints, a famous one by Hiroshige called Entrance to the Cave, uh, where you see the water foaming around the base. So you can see his of the rock foundation in the Japanese prints. And you can see how he's tried to sort of recreate this, with all these different flicking colors, the light bouncing off the chalk surface, the spray coming up, all these little individual tashes of light and dark to try to recreate that sort of um, foaming water. And uh, the manor port is often seen to see, or the series of it, is seen to be one of the sort of like embryo embryonic series, as they are six canvases. And a rather interesting, Guy de Maupassant, who watched Monet and his family at work um, because he was often assisted, uh, particularly by the Hochaday children, Blanche in particular, who would have a wheelbarrow and she would wheel the canvases along. Uh, the artist walked along the beach, followed by children, uh, carrying five or six canvases representing the same subject at different times of the day and with different effects. It's all about the effect. Uh, he took them up and put them aside at turns according to changes in the sky and the shadows. And then these would be refined back in the studio. So it's now uh, that we could actually talk about a proper uh, development of a series. So the haystacks are, were just outside um, his home at uh, Giverny. The Cider Press was its original name. Uh, bright sunlight here looking towards the poplars that follow the line of the river Ept, which is the local uh, tributary. And initially you can see he experiments with different times of the day and even includes figures. He hasn't quite yet refined it to this idea of exactly the same motif uh, painted over and over again. Look at the uh, coloured shadows in particular, the bright sunlight of one and the dappled shadows of the other. And then they become uh, sort of solidified into the same motif, these two very distinctive grain stacks or hay stacks, which had such profound effect on the young Kandinsky. He saw these and basically his vision was transformed uh, through the lens of Monet's uh, late Impressionism. 
The, the locals hated Monet. Remember, he's not yet married Alice. As far as he's, they're concerned, he's a, a rather unsavory character living in their village. So the locals tore down the haystacks as quickly as they could uh, to stop Monet painting them. The same was true of the poplars. Uh, they belonged to a local farmer and they threatened to cut them down to stop Monet painting them. So he had to buy the trees. <laughs> I rather like this story. He had to, to buy the trees to paint them and then sold them on afterwards. They wanted to harvest them. I mean, they are in effect a crop. The Poplars here at Germany, 1891, this series. And we have a joke in the trade that it looks like a dollar sign. Monet, uh, money, sorry, it's terrible. Um, and this is the same idea, but a slightly different view where you have these uprights at the front, I love the purple one, and then the bend of the river behind giving you the sweep of the Poplars. And then obviously Rouen Cathedral, I'm just showing you two. Originally, there were 30 that he devised. Uh, he painted them directly in front of the cathedral from inside a shop. Again, the locals weren't too keen. They didn't like this dirty old man painting in what was quite an upmarket ladies' dress shop. And they sort of curtained him off in front of the window so that the other customers couldn't see him. Then 20 of the canvases were refined and shown in 1893 at the... Uh, gallery of Durand Ruel, in effect a one-man show. By this stage, Durand, uh, Durand Ruel has captured an American market. And so this is when you could really say that Monet finds wealth and happiness. I'm showing you here, um, and that's the, the, this facade is known as the, uh, and the tower is the tower at saint Romain uh, in sunlight and at sunset. So high noon and sunset. And it's at this stage that my last little section on the water lily, so we're, we've almost made it. Um, I had a surfeit of beautiful images to choose from, as I think you've gathered, but I've tried to contextualize it for you. Uh, realize how Normandy was really important for him. All the series, um, the haystacks, the poplars, and a Rouen Cathedral. Well, the, the first two series are actually painted in and around Germany. And then obviously Rouen Cathedral is the regional capital. But it's the success of those series, which are supposed to be almost like harmonious or harmonic paintings. The idea was that they would literally be a symphony of color. And you can get some really good reconstructions on the internet showing you how you were to arrange the uh, Rouen Cathedral series as modulating colors, which would, be, would simulate the notes of music. Um, at the time, the state actually seriously considered buying the whole set as it was seen to be a cultural landmark. But just like now, governments won't buy works of art. Anyway, the money from the series is important. It gives him stability. He is able to buy the cider press, a Germany. And it is now that he can really develop his garden. The water pond from 1893, the bridge added in 1895, and the pond extended. The locals hated this as well, by the way. They said that his introduction of aquatic plants, particularly his water lilies, um, would poison the local cattle. So everything that Monet did in Germany, uh, which is why he was rather a, a sort of solitary figure within the community, was everything he tried to do uh, they put up resistance. The important thing is that the pond is almost like a mirror. So, it, and now you're going to see it becomes a focus of his interest, particularly not so much the Clot Normand, which is the original flower garden, but now he's able to buy the piece of land over the railway track, it's now a road, and develop that as his water garden. This one's in the Getty and is showing you the famous bridge. Here it is, perhaps better, and emulating a Japanese print, you can draw those lines across, those horizontal bands. This one's in Princeton and is dominated by blue. And there's a whole sequence of these um, bridges, mostly dating to 1889, the bridge under different conditions, uh, you know, light and weather. And, and I'm afraid, although the best time to go to Germany is er very early May or late April, depending on how cold our winter hat is, 
is when the, of course, the wisteria comes out. It is, it's both, it's Chinese and Japanese wisteria. So it's purple and white uh, blended together. But the problem is the world and his wife is also there wanting to see the wisteria on the bridge. Here's me being arty, because uh, it is wonderful. And this is Monet uh, standing on his own bridge uh, once the superstructure had been completed. It was originally uh, built, as you can see, if we can go back, uh, without the superstructure from which the wisteria hangs. This is a good example of what I mean about you wouldn't take Monet as a painter per se. You'd think he was the gardener when you went to visit. And remember that his eyesight begins to, uh, to fail. He suffers from cataracts. He'll actually attempt uh, a pioneering uh, procedure to have the cataracts removed, but that completely changes his color balance towards the end of his life. So uh, he dies in 1926, remember. So here is a late uh, vision of the bridge, the Japanese bridge in these rather violent oranges and, pur and uh, purples. But then to conclude, he gets a boat. Uh, the, the actual painting of the boat is 1887, I borrowed it. But it's to introduce this idea that on the boat, and the real boat on the left-hand side is at uh, Giverny, uh, he'll now float out over the water, literally painting the surface. And he tells us that he wants to paint what's under the water, what's on top of the water, and what's above the water, the water lilies. The water lilies are just a vehicle, really, for his, his experimentation. It's very Japanese print-like. He completely uh, loses the edge of the pond. There's a strong verticality. You feel the lilies are going up rather than back. The three best ones are in Wales, not in the National Gallery in London, but in the Davis bequest. And the uh, Margaret and Gwendolyn Davis, very wealthy uh, Welsh uh, ladies, spinsters, who put all their money and passion into the arts. They actually bought these water lilies in 1905 and 1908. Uh, they were very daring young ladies as well. I think I like the top one the best, but I'll leave it up to you. But they're always on show in the National Gallery of Wales. And this image here uh, from 1914-17 is, is the important one in a way. It's this idea that the water is a mirror. We've moved a long way from simply exploring the effects of light on an object or painting quickly out of doors. Now there is almost like a manifesto, this idea of sort of capturing something so fleeting as the clouds reflected in the mirror of the water. It is this mirror that's the important thing in capturing the, the fleeting uh, sky and the subtle movement of the water itself. Uh, this one's from 1916, 1919. He builds a really big studio to accommodate these very, very large canvases. And now the canvas itself becomes part of the motif. He doesn't cover it completely. It sort of shines through as a background. And again, you can make lots of comparisons here with the cropping to photography and the Japanese print. Uh, this one's in Munich in the uh, Neupanatotec, and I just love the colour. You know, uh, looking, the symphonies in colour, you know, depending on the light, there'll be a sort of aqua blue or a sort of aquamarine blue. Gentlemen, I apologise. Women's colour perception is better than yours, so it's quite interesting to think about Monet. That's, that's technical, I'm afraid. We really do, biologically have slightly better colour perception, which is why your wife is always telling you you're wearing the wrong tie. Anyway, to end, I wanted uh, just the, this rather beautiful but slightly melancholic uh, quote. So most importantly, at the end of his life, Monet uh, leaves quite a good a series of re reflections on his own practice as an artist. We have a lot of art critics writing about him. Now he's, of course, a doyen, he's the grand old man painting uh, his water lilies at Germany. He's, a, he's an establishment figure. And so many, of course, sort of revere him. So these landscapes of water and reflections have become my obsession. They are far beyond my old man powers. And despite everything, I want to succeed in conveying what I feel. So we've gone be beyond observation 
to sort of this idea of emotional attachment, this, well, to use his own words, this idea of sensation, the effect that looking has on Monet's emotions. I destroy some, I start over again, and I hope something will finally come from so many efforts. It rather alarms me when you hear about him burning his canvases because he's not happy with them. So I leave you with my last slide, uh, which is in the orangerie. And this is, I think, in a way, a, a nice uh, place to sort of reflect back on what we've been looking at, in that Monet painted these as a gift to the nation to revive the country's spirits following the First World War. Emotionally and physically, France had been traumatized by the war. And he wanted, this is Monet, he wanted to give these to the nation to help them heal. And I'm hoping that I've used my images today in a rather similar way. Oh, we're constantly being told how important it is to think about our mental health. So for me, certainly art is an incredible lifesaver. If I feel depressed, all I have to do um, is to look not necessarily at a Monet, but I might look at a Soroya. There's all sorts of artists who are my favorites. The important thing is that just as Monet painted these to revive the spirits, of the French nation after the terrors of the First World War. Hopefully we can find solace in, water, in the water lilies in 2020. Thank you.